I am Justin Zalewski. I'm the Director of Product Strategy and Design at Studio Science. My guest today is Justin Zalewski, who is a people-centered design leader with more than 10 years of experience in product design, product strategy, and service design. As Director of Product Design and Strategy at Studio Science, Justin leads a team of talented product designers and works with clients to solve business problems through design. He and his team are experts in rapid prototyping and running experiments to learn from customers. He has led projects with clients ranging from market-leading tech companies to Fortune 500 brands. Clients include Angie, Genesis, Simon, Stack Overflow, and Cummings. In this episode, we talked about how new technologies and tools impact the role of a UX designer and what new responsibilities the people who create products hold as a result. Justin introduces the idea that products are actually digital services, as in software as a service, and gives examples on how he's worked with customers and product managers to improve their metrics, promoting co-creation and designing for the real world. For UX designers who want to find their place working with product managers, and PMs who want to challenge their perspectives on building products. This is a great episode to get some inspiration and actionable tips. Welcome to Product Perspectives, the podcast for product people that gives a voice to their stakeholders, hosted by Magali Pelissier. Each weekly episode shows you the other side of the product with interviews of the people who contribute to making products a success. They are engineers, writers, marketers, support analysts, UX designers, or even salespeople. Not only will they get the credit they deserve, but they will share their perspectives on what makes a good product and product manager. Stakeholder management is a key skill for product managers, so just as you're obsessed with listening to your customers, let's hear from your stakeholders. So welcome, Justin. I want to dive straight away into your experience because it's quite impressive. You've got 10 years of experience in product design, in strategy, and in service design as well. What have you seen changing over the last 10 years in those fields? Yeah, well, what's been cool to see is I think a a growth in the design maturity of product teams, and and that might just be uh, my own perspective as, as I've grown in the last 10 years and got introduced to more and more different companies. But I see more people now recognize how important UX research is, how important it is to create with your customers and just how critical it is to zoom out occasionally and design the experience more holistically. Um, Whereas, you know, before I just saw a lot more common people getting a little too myopic and narrowly focused on uh, particular uh, screens or, or just really distinct problems and failing to kind of connect the broader picture. So it's been cool to see that kind of trend um, in the product world as a whole. Do you still see some companies maybe lagging behind a bit? And is there a trend in part, some particular industries? Yeah, you know, I actually see uh, in, in the financial industry and, and healthcare a lot as well. I, I see a lot of great strides in moving forward and evaluating experiences more holistically. Um, and I'm not sure exactly why that is, uh, but I, I think that's an encouraging trend just because those are some of the, the services that affect people's lives so significantly. So to, to really take that view of the experiences is really great. Um, I do still see some companies kind of lagging behind, um, giving them the benefit of the doubt. I think it most of the time has to do with constraints of various sizes. You know, if they're a, an early stage startup, they got to choose where they're going to focus their attention, their time and their resources. And sometimes, it, you know, there, there's ways to, to stay lean um, by focusing on a, a certain spot. Um, and I, you know, I get it. Like you got to make the tough, tough calls and there are certain trade-offs to that. Um, but what's great is that I, I see a lot of mature companies and in, in especially mature industries like financial services and healthcare um, education, for example, really embracing the the value of looking at experiences holistically, great designer product manager collaboration um, and, and with engineering as well. And I think those industries are where we see the most potential for innovative technologies like artificial intelligence or virtual reality. How do you think those new technologies, I, I keep on saying new at some point, I'm going to have to stop, those technologies <laughs> recent are going to change product design and service design? Yeah, well, I mean, like you said, they're already they've already changed the field, right? And they're already changing the field. 
um, you know, we've, we're all seeing everything that's come up uh, with ChatGPT and, and all this stuff, which is fascinating in its own right, just people getting more access to this kinds of technology than they have in the past. But I think there's a few ways where designers and product managers need to adapt going forward. So first, I think it's going to require a more technical understanding from our, our roles uh, to just understand these new possibilities, how they could relate to the products and services that we work on. Second, and this one's more designer specific, uh, but applies to product managers as well. Um, the tools that we use will, will need to change. So for example, we use Figma a ton right now, right? Um, that's great for prototyping screens, but it isn't quite built for AI and VR experiences, not yet, at least. Uh, there people are doing some really cool things with plugins and then adapting um, these kinds of things, but I think we'll see those tools grow with us as we need to adapt as well. And then with any new technology, but AI is maybe the best example of this. We as the people that build products and services have a responsibility to build it in a way that's optimized for the positive outcomes that we're trying to drive and mitigate those negative consequences, you know, even the unintended ones. So this has always been the case, but AI, I think, just amplifies that power and reach of the technology so much that it becomes that much more critical. So I'm going to jump straight away on my question about tools then. So you said Figma is not quite built for AI. Like, what do you see is the future of maybe those design tools? Because Figma was already quite innovative when it came into the market. Yeah, and to be clear, I'm I'm team Figma. You know, we're, we... we uh, have been all in on Figma for, for you know many years now at this point, um, and it's our prototyping tool of choice. But as you get into prototyping new kinds of experiences with new kinds of technology, it's it's not enough just to have a clickable prototype. You know, even as, as advanced as those prototypes can be, you really got to prototype the whole experience and to really test something out or to run an experiment. You need to connect it to data. You need to figure out like how that operates over time and in a variety of circumstances. So it, it becomes it becomes that much more important to collaborate between design, product management, and engineering. You really need to build out some proof of concepts. You need to test with pilot programs that get you a little closer to reality than a clickable prototype would in, in these kinds of situations. So it's just, it's going to change the way we think about prototypes and in a lot of ways, the, the bar that we set for our prototypes. And it's a good bridge to a recent post and I think a talk you made recently about the fact that clickable prototypes aren't enough. If I take my perspective as a product manager, they are the cheapest. You know, I'm obviously very bought into the idea of an MVP and I know that sometimes it can be a bit of an area of friction with UX design. So, okay, you tell me clickable prototypes aren't enough. What's your suggestion? What else could we do? Yeah, I mean, we, we love our clickable prototypes, right? Like, and it's so much easier to create them now than it was even even five years ago. Like they can be so much more realistic and valuable now than they could have been in the past. And there's, uh, you know, for a, the foreseeable future, going to still be a huge purpose and value in clickable prototypes. But the problem to me happens when we stop there and when we use that as like the, the be all end all of the experience that we're prototyping. So I think there's two issues. One is it ignores the moments between the screens. You know, what's happening with your customer isn't always happening on the screen. So all these things are happening with the passage of time. Their context is changing. They might be changing the channels that they're interacting with your service and your, your company. And so because their context and their needs and their goals could change along that journey and depending on what they're doing in between interacting with these beautiful screens that we've designed, that needs to be tested and, and evaluated as well. And so that's one of those things where, like I said, you know, pilot programs, other kinds of prototyping and testing and evaluating experience come into play and you can't stop just at the, the clickable prototype. The other gap I see that creating sometimes is all those things that are required to make the experience a reality. And so the clickable prototype is often the customer facing part of the experience or, or at least a significant part of it. But if you don't account for the people, the processes and the systems, all those things that support that intended UX, then it's gonna compromise the ability for the organization to actually deliver that experience. And so that's where we use, you know, there's a variety of different ways to do this, but we use a tool called a service blueprint in service design. We actually map, you know, all right, here's the customer journey and what we intend for them to experience along the way or what they are experience, experiencing along the way. 
But here's what we're doing at each stage in, in different departments of our organization. Uh, you know, here's our customer service reps are interacting. Here's where our sales reps are coming into play. Here's these systems that are here. Here's where there's this legacy outdated system that's causing issues, you know, mapping things out at that higher level is going to give you all this visibility to figure out like, all right, what, what's really affecting the customer experience and what do we need to address? Um, and that's all in the current state. You can also use that in a future state kind of way of, all right, we're designing this future vision, but now let's map at each stage, like what needs to be true to actually build this. And, you know, you're going to discover things along the way in the actual pursuit of building that, but just taking a moment to, to map it all out and realize how interconnected everything is, we found to be really valuable just to highlight some of those conversations more proactively rather than them coming as surprises later on in the process. Great, and that's a good transition because you dropped the word services quite a lot in this response. And you told me that most of the things we call products nowadays are actually more accurately referred to as digital services. So can you expand on this? I think that, I mean, the language of products has really stuck around over the years. So even the job title of product manager is from a time when product managers were really in charge of physical products as single objects you know, back in the 30s with Procter & Gamble. But now, for the most part, we're not trying to sell more widgets to people. The new challenges are about how to live healthier lives, how to use our resources more efficiently, create better transportation, financial systems, all these kinds of things. And these are the kinds of things that services address more effectively than products. So for example, your bank doesn't just provide you an app, they provide an entire service and experience around it, which is designed, hopefully, to meet your needs along your journey. Even the industry that a lot of us work in, SaaS, um, you know, it's, it's right in the name, it's software as a service. Like these are things that we provide as an ongoing service to our customers' journeys. Um, and for us to think about it that way, I think helps us to, to better accommodate the kinds of challenges and opportunities that come along with a service that aren't inherent in single touchpoint products. Okay, that's a convincing thing. Going back to Figma and how we do projects. So can you tell me one example maybe where the team was getting stuck into thinking of product and thinking with that low fidelity or clickable prototype and changing the paradigm or changing the, the prototype, bringing some higher fidelity has completely changed the perspective and has enabled you to deliver some great outcomes? I mean, there have been times when we set out and we're, we're working with a client that we believe it's in, uh, you know, for example, there's a, a low adoption rate, for example, um, of a new product or service they've released out into the world. And they're like, why is, why is nobody using this? Why is nobody registering it? And uh, we go in and sometimes we have this assumption too, but uh, you know, in this case, the, the client had this assumption where, you know, it's probably has to do with our onboarding UX, right? Which we've seen that a ton. And so it's, a, you know, a lot of times it's a pretty good assumption. And so we'll go in and, you know, while we can evaluate, you know, heuristically and with customers, the current state of like, all right, here's your onboarding experience. Here's where people are running into issues. Uh, when we zoomed out a little bit and actually looked at, all right, here's how this is being rolled out. Here's how it's being sold in different channels. Here's how it's being marketed. Uh, that allowed us it, with one particular client in the manufacturing industry, it allowed us to realize that it, it wasn't actually an issue with the onboarding UX. It was actually an issue of awareness where the sales team had no incentives to actually sell this particular service. The marketing team didn't even know about it for the most part. And so it wasn't in, in the loop enough to really market it. And so it became more of an awareness problem than it was an onboarding UX problem. So that's one of those things where if we would have stayed, you know, focused or overly focused on the actual ux of onboarding we wouldn't have had the opportunity to zoom out and look at what are all these other factors coming into play of getting somebody on board here um, you know how do we uh, break down silos between sales and marketing and delivery and actually figure out like what's what's going on here because it is all so connected it's easy to jump to those first assumptions Right. And I think that's a good example of thinking broader than the narrow definition of UX design, which some people still think of as UI design sometimes right. even worse. Yeah. But uh, so it, it makes me wonder that you 
overlap quite a lot with the product manager on that kind of thing. So how do you work? Like, did the idea come from you or do you work collaboratively with the product manager? How does that work so you don't step on each other's tools and you still complement each other? Yeah, that's a great question because there is so much overlap between a uh, at, at least a, a, a great or more more senior like product designer type role and a product manager that also realizes how important it is to collaborate with uh, designers and, and with customers. And that overlap can lead to conflict, but in the best situations, uh, we found that to lead to just a good understanding and partnership uh, between the two roles. So in, in the example I gave, that was uh, an initiative driven by us where we, we took that higher level perspective, but there have been other times where uh, the the product manager is bringing their own perspective and and you know letting us know about uh, you know because they've they're in this all day every day and they carry with this all this kind of historical context and knowledge that's so crucial to us being able to see different opportunities. So I think that collaboration is is really important and I I struggle to think of two roles that would be a a better pairing than the product manager and product designer just because of that overlap, um, you know, as as product managers are are there to drive these different business outcomes and embrace a mentality of running experiments and being outcome rather than output driven. That's something that we see the best product designers doing as well. We should be able to understand each other better because of that overlap. Oh yeah, definitely. And don't, don't get me wrong, that's the dream for a product manager, but yeah. the UX designer raises at that level and is able to really complement uh, the work that I do and we really are on the same page. So your experience is quite varied and you've worked uh, on many projects with a variety of companies. So if you could pick one, what is the most memorable experience you've had and why? Yeah, this is always a tough question to, to answer, but I'm going to go with, I mean, one of my favorites is our work with company called Angie, formerly known as Angie's List. Um, they're based in the US and they have they provide a way to find contractors or service providers to work on your home projects. So roofers, plumbers, et cetera. If I'm like, you know, hey, I, I don't have an electrician. Like who, who do I get? How do I make sure they're not gonna rip me off? You know, how, how do I find a quality contractor? Um, which is hard to do, especially right now, there's a, a lot of demand for it. And so uh, we worked with them when they were in a, a state of change and uh, one of my favorite things about the the project is is a couple of things. One, we worked with them to map out their customer journey in a way that wasn't just their customer's journey with their product, but their customer's journey of identifying when a home project needs to be done, when they need to hire for it, how they hire for it, how they manage that project, how they pay, like the the whole journey of a home project rather than their journey with the Angie's List product. It was cool to kind of broaden the lens in that way, you know, in the theme of zooming out, right? But uh, what was also cool is tying that directly to opportunities for revenue. And so if you can picture, I'm sure a lot of us have seen a customer journey map. One of the more valuable things we started with and it became this ongoing living document that their team used for a long time after that and started to, you know, add on to and uh, adapt was this customer journey map that at the bottom, at each stage of the journey, we identified not just here's the current state of what's going on and where are the pain points and you know, the typical things you see on a journey map, but also what are the opportunities to provide more value in a way that overlaps with business goals um, and could be new revenue opportunities. And so this was at a time when taking down the, the paywall just because you know it was no longer feasible to charge people for access to reviews and this kind of thing because that stuff is so plentifully available now. And so they needed to find new ways to, to realize value. And so that whole initiative resulted in these, here's different ways to provide value to our customers and potentially capture revenue by helping them find inspiration for projects at this stage of the journey, or by helping them manage their projects in that part of the journey. Um, and it was also actionable that we actually, in this workshop, that the research culminated in, we actually prioritized and prototyped just in quick you know, paper prototype sketches with their team. All right, here's how we could turn these opportunities into potential solutions. And one of my other favorite things about this project was that that workshop was so not only cross-disciplinary where we had 
design, product, engineering all involved there, but it was so multi-layered where we had everybody from the, you know, the in the weeds designers and developers that would be working on this experience all the way up through company leadership, including Angie herself, the, you know, the namesake of, of the company um, involved in, in giving their buy-in and perspective all throughout the way. And that just kicked us off with so much momentum that we were able to immediately start advancing some of these and, and you know, start prototyping and testing these out um, rather than needing to go from that to get more buy-in and, and approvals. Um, it just really accelerated things, starting with the right people in the room. That's a great example. And you've said the word co-creation, which leads me to the part of a podcast in which somebody you know asks you a question. So this is Andy Allen, who works at Studio Science with you and fills the product manager role with multiple clients. So let's hear the question. Hey, Justin, it's Andy. What are some of your favorite ways to co-create with customers rather than just designing for them? I, I think there's two buckets that I'll, I'll put my, my favorites into. So the first opportunity to co-create with customers is during research. So rather than just interviewing them, which is still really valuable, of course, there are a lot of more participatory methods to invite customers in, be more actively involved in the process. So for example, we were doing some research with a company called InterSystems, uh, you know, big healthcare data company. Um, Rather than interviewing and then synthesizing what we found in a journey map, we had the customers map their own experiences on a virtual whiteboard because we were conducting all this remotely. So this way, the customer is more actively involved. Plus, as they're visually mapping out their own journey, rather than just speaking to it, they can see how it's all coming together and it brings up new ideas for them. You know, I think we've all been, you know, this is the whole value of whiteboarding, right? Like you can see it there, it's going to generate new ideas. Same thing with customers as they're mapping this out it's going to generate new ideas for them. So we end up getting more insights and value out of the research as a result. But another example, when we're designing a new dashboard for a SaaS product, we prepare this build your own dashboard toolkit for customers. And we have them actually build their ideal dashboard. And you know, it's not meant to look great. It's no replacement for the UI and UX work that goes into creating great data visualizations and intuitive dashboard experience. But what it does is it reveals so much more about what they need from a dashboard for them to actually build it themselves with this toolkit um, than if we were to just stop at asking them questions. We still ask a lot of questions, of course, but giving them this toolkit, which can easily be done remotely, um, they can just better show us what they need rather than just tell us. And this results in better solutions as well because the customers are already directly involved in the ideation rather than the idea is always coming exclusively from designers and product managers. So this way, when we're running these sessions, we can take more of a facilitator role and let the customer's own lived experience shine through. That is brilliant. I have invited lots of stakeholders in my customer journey mapping exercise, including sometimes a few users, but they've always been part of it. Like I was driving the thing and they would just put a few post-its here and there, but having them creating the journey map from scratch and creating their own dashboard, I think that's a brilliant idea. Yeah, it's really cool to see just how they articulate their own journeys and, and what, what comes up differently in those kinds of situations as opposed to an interview. Yeah, and I think it really gets them to think about the, that product mindset, how we think. So they build some empathy with us and how we operate. Yeah, great point. You're totally right. Great. Okay, so I bombarded you with questions. I think you have one question for me. I do, yeah. I was curious to ask, in your experience as a product manager, I'm sure you've worked with a variety of different product designers. So I wanted to ask, what are the things that the most effective product designers have in common? Do I have to choose one? I've got two. I, I, yeah, because this do. is my podcast, I can do two. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, because I had one um, which is based on previous UX designers, which I interviewed. What I've really appreciated is when they demonstrate actually what we were talking about just before that empathy towards me as a product manager. They understand the constraints I'm under and why sometimes we have to make some decisions that aren't easy and that are a bit unpopular with some stakeholders. So I really appreciated that. But what you've also said at the beginning of this episode resonated a lot with me. 
people who have that kind of mindset like you, we can do more than the narrow UX design role, like thinking about the broader experience, leading that workshop with customers and just let's do it. And you lead that and you have some innovative ideas like this. That sense of ownership, accountability and taking initiatives from a product designer's perspective, I think that's something I, I value most, more than any technical skill. This is something that really helps me as a product manager. And I think that is what has made me successful in my interactions with UX designers before. I love that. Yeah, there, there is so much to just having someone that knows how to deal with the ambiguity and complexity of like, it's not a, a clear cut task, but like they know what needs to be done and to figure out a way forward. Yes. So great. So one question I'm curious about is, is there any book that you're reading right now or that you've read in the past that's really inspired you and you'd like to share it with us? Yeah, I'm going to go. So I, I recently spent some time just reflecting on some of my favorite books of 2022 um, now last year. Um, and the I mean, one of the ones that sticks out the most that I want to highlight is a book called Design for the Real World by Victor Papanek. Uh, so it's about a lot of things, uh, and it's it's not a new book. It was written, uh, you know, decades ago, um, but it's still just as relevant today. Um, it's mainly about the ability and responsibility that we have as creators to improve people's lives. And so I think it's interesting because it was written from a very, like, industrial design point of view, um, kind of going back to, like, the history of, like, product manager title, right, back when it was, like, actual products. Um, but now that we're in the world of services, you know, it's still just as just as relevant. Um, all the points are, are uh, I, I think, equally relevant to product managers and designers, really anybody that's involved in creating for people um, in, in any form, but especially you know, creating for customers. Right. Do you think they could do maybe an updated version? Because now you don't want to design product for the real world, but almost like for the virtual world, for the metaverse and thinking about how the world has changed with social media, AI and all that thing. You know, that would be really interesting because uh, I, I think there's a, a theme in that book about uh, how often we get obsessed with creating things for a specific type of market. And, you know, there's a better term for it, but specifically like wealthy people, right? Um, and design for the real world is like, how do we design for the rest of humanity too, right? But I wanna be careful what I said, because I don't think there's, I don't think there's no application for, you know, VR and AI and, and, and whatever else for, you know, the, the entire world. But today it's a pretty small subset of the world that cares about and, and uses that. They might change going forward, but uh, I think that exactly that same kind of perspective of like, what is the impact we're creating becomes even more important with some of those new technologies that will have just an, an outsized impact on humanity as a whole. Great point. And that makes me think I want to add one third point about some things I'm looking for in UX designers when I work with them. It's that sensibility towards thinking about inclusion, like how do we include people who may not have access to this service then or who are excluded because we use such technology. Yeah, very important. Yeah, great point. Great. It's the final part of this interview in which I ask you fire questions. So it's multiple choices and you can pick one of them. And if you want, you can elaborate. Sounds good. I'm ready. Great. Graphic design or interaction design? For me, interaction design. Podcast, blog or book? Book, personally. Individual contributor or team manager? Manager. And I'll, and I'll elaborate on that one a little bit. It's something where I, I did not initially see myself taking the management track and I, I found an appreciation and a love for it over time, but it, I find it to be very fulfilling just having the opportunity to, to coach and to you know, pour into other people's success. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. I would say give it a go and see. And normally with most companies, you would have the option if really you don't like it, but yeah, great point. Yeah. In the office or remote? Remote. And, and I'll qualify that with, I, I have the privilege of being able to do a kind of a hybrid situation where I'll go into the office like once a week. I am uh, in, in, in full favor of remote work. Figma, Adobe or Sketch, even if I think I know the answer. Yeah, you, you, you're right. We, we spoiled it a little earlier, but uh, I'm, I'm all in on Figma. And Microsoft Teams or Slack? Slack for sure. Um, do you get people that, that go Teams? <laughs> That is a very good question. <laughs> I don't think ever. <laughs> I, I know a lot of people that use Teams. I don't know anyone that's chosen Teams over Slack. I'll put it that way. 
I think Teams is a bit like spreadsheet. Everybody uses them and has to use them, but nobody really, really likes them. Yeah. Right. OK, so we've got listeners who are product managers and they liked the idea of co-creation and service design. So what would you recommend? How could they partner with their UX designers and on back the rest of the team as well to go into that approach of co-creation? Yeah, it's it's so much about the mindset with co-creation and even a you know, service design approach. Um, but I, I think to, to bring it tactical and you know, one of the ways to start to bring some of those siloed teams together, I think product managers and designers are ideal partners to, to help to work together to make that kind of change in an organization. To get a little more practical with it, a couple ways that I typically recommend starting is one, to just start to build relationships and that's internal and external. So with your customers, however you can to, to go from, you know, the occasional user test where you'll reach out to recruit, but actually start to build some relationships where people can uh, participate in, in workshops in more participatory co-creation methods. Um, maybe you even have some, you know, customer advisory board that exists today, um, but it's very stodgy and formal, but how do you, you know, open that up to, you know, be a little more uh, transparent and collaborative in that. Um, and then that, you know, th those are the external relationships, but internally as well, just, you know, where, where are the points of friction between departments? Where are the silos? Um, what are the departments that you know have an outsized impact on what you're trying to deliver, but there's just this wall between and uh, coming up with ways like, how do we break those walls down? How do we build an understanding? Uh, you know, who do I need to take out to lunch and really understand their perspective and start with building a relationship as the foundation rather than just seeing, you know, what I need this department to deliver, right? And then second, I like to recommend to people to map out their service with a service blueprint, which can be as simple as taking your customer journey map and then just adding another layer on there of what are the things that we're doing as an organization to actually make that experience possible. So that could be like, where are our different departments involved in direct contact with the customer? What are our systems and processes in place that affect this experience? And just mapping that all out will, will give you some really clear indicators of, you know, where are the areas that are creating some friction right now? Um, what are the opportunity areas? But it'll really help you to zoom out and evaluate and see where things are connected. I think you're the winner. The person who said the word perspectives the most in the podcast. <laughs> I, I love this because that's exactly why uh, the podcast named like this. So if people want to carry on the conversation with you to talk about co-creation, service design, or anything else, even the, the book you mentioned, what should they do? You can find a little bit more about me at justinzaluski.com. You can find out more about Studio Science at studioscience.com. Yeah, anybody that wants to connect, I would love to chat with anybody that's interested in these kind of topics. Topics. Um, LinkedIn is really the only social network I'm active on anymore. So feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn. We'd be happy to connect. Perfect. Thank you so much. I thought it was a very insightful interview. I've learned a lot from your different perspective and uh, it was fun as well. Yeah, I had a great time. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and colleagues and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. If you have suggestions for topics and guests, or any feedback, you can write to Magali Pellissier at hotmail.fr.